Right then, welcome back to the wonderful world of War Thunder, where today we'll be taking a little look at everyone's favourite float plane, the Mitsubishi F1 M2. As always with these videos and such, I shall be doing the bit with the history and the technical details first. If you want to miss out on all the fun and just watch a battle, may I suggest exiting full screen mode and scrolling down a little until you get to the video description. There you should see a little blue number. If you go ahead and click it, it will transport you through time and space to the distant future, a place where all the historical and technical bits have already been discussed, and you can watch a battle without fear of judgement. Alternatively, you can listen to what this video is really all about, the history of the Mitsubishi F1 M2. This isn't really my kind of music, but okay. Japan had been a little behind during the pioneering years of aviation. Their first aircraft, a Farman 3, piloted by First Lieutenant Yoshitoshi Tokugawa, not flying until 1910. Although he designed an improved version of that aircraft, designated Kaishiki No. 1, Japan still relied heavily on foreign imports, meaning that when World War I came around, the Imperial Japanese Army Air Service, then called the Provisional Air Corps, consisted of four Maurice Farman MF-7 reconnaissance aircraft and one Newport 6-M monoplane, which was technically a civilian sporting aircraft. These were used against the Germans during the Siege of Tsingtao. It was not until after the First World War that Japan began taking a serious interest in aviation, specifically military aviation. They purchased a large number of surplus aircraft from Europe, including spads from France and sopped with strutters from Britain, and even invited a French military mission comprised of 63 members and led by Jacques-Paul Farr. This mission was to help Japan organize a military aircraft establishment, and for this purpose they brought with them a number of aircraft, including Newport 24s, Spad 13s, Salmson 2A2s, Brejuet 14s, and even two Kakuo observation dirigibles. This mission meant that a Japanese aviation command hierarchy had been established by 1919, meaning that Japan was ready to join the Allied forces supporting the White Russian forces fighting the Bolshevik Red Army during the Siberian intervention. The first Japanese aviation company, the Nakajima Aircraft Company, was established in 1916. However, they did not start licensed producing aircraft, specifically the Newport 24 and the Newport Delage NID 29C1 fighters, the latter of which was designated Nakajima Co. 4 until after the war. Mitsubishi Heavy Industries and Kawasaki Heavy Industries also got in on the action, producing such machines as the Kawasaki Army Otsu-1 reconnaissance aircraft, which was a licensed produced version of the Selmson 2A2, the Kawasaki Army Type 88 reconnaissance aircraft designed by Dr. Richard Vogt, who had been hired from Germany, and the bizarre Mitsubishi 1MT torpedo bomber, which was designed by Herbert Smith from Sopwith Aviation. The Yokosuka Naval Air Technical Arsenal was founded in 1869 as the Yokosuka Naval Arsenal, which conducted shipbuilding and repair for the Imperial Japanese Navy. In 1917, Yokosuka designed and built the Yokosuka Rogo Kogata, which was a much more capable aircraft than the Maurice Farman MF-7 floatplane that the Navy had had to make do with until that point. These served the Imperial Japanese Navy until the mid-1920s. In September 1921, a mission led by Captain William Forbes Sempill and consisting of 27 members of the Royal Air Force and Royal Navy set off for Japan. Much like the French mission of 1918, this mission was to help the Imperial Japanese Navy establish a naval air aviation hierarchy. The Gloucester Sparrowhawks they brought with them also helped the Japanese perfect the art of naval aviation, performing feats such as carrier takeoffs and landings and torpedo bombing. Now we must divert from the main line of development for the Japanese Navy, including aircraft carriers and torpedoes and such, as they are not strictly relevant at this point, and turn instead to the role of naval reconnaissance. I know how marvellously exciting, but please try to remain still as I talk about this fascinating subject. Anyways, after the Yokosuka Rogo Kogata, of which 218 examples were built, came the Navy Type Hansa, 
This was essentially a Hansa Brandenburg W-29, delivered from Germany as part of the war reparations. The Japanese decided to make this aircraft part of the standard inventory, and commissioned Nakajima and Aichi to manufacture more in 1922. These served alongside the Yokosuka Rogo Kogata until 1926, whereby the Yokosuka aircraft was retired from military service. Although the Type Hansa was unpopular with its pilots, being difficult to control on the water and featuring poor downwards visibility, it served until 1928, with 310 examples being built. In 1921, Yokosuka began development of a new reconnaissance floatplane to replace the Rogo Kogata. The first attempt, designed by the Short Brothers from Britain, was named the Type 10, however this aircraft performed poorly. The subsequent models, designated Type 10 Model A and Type 10 Model B, only partially improved matters, and although the Japanese Navy ordered a few pre-production examples of the latter, they were not adopted. This prompted Yokosuka to redesign the aircraft from the ground up, reducing the wingspan, lowering the overall weight, and installing a more powerful engine. This new aircraft, designated the Type 14 Reconnaissance Seaplane, was accepted into service with the Japanese Navy in 1926 as the Yokosuka E-1Y. This came in two versions, the Type 14-1, or E-1Y-1, which featured two seats, and the Type 14-2, or E-1Y-2, with three seats. The E-1Y-3 featured a redesigned tail and a modified engine, giving it improved performance over its predecessors, and entered service in 1931. The E-1Y was the primary reconnaissance seaplane of the Japanese Navy during the late 1920s and early 1930s, operating from warship catapults and seaplane tenders. These saw some service during the Second Sino-Japanese War, but was retired in 1932, with 218 having been built, in total by Yokosuka, Nakajima and Aichi. In 1927, following a competition between Aichi, Yokosuka and Nakajima to produce a replacement for the Navy Type Hansa, Nakajima's Type 15 was selected, and adopted as the Nakajima E2N. Two versions of this aircraft were built, the E-2N-1 reconnaissance seaplane and the E-2N-2 intermediate trainer. This was the last all-wooden construction aircraft to be adopted by the Japanese Navy. The E-2N was retired in 1930, by which time 77 had been built by Nakajima and Kawanishi. After that came the Navy Type 90-1 reconnaissance seaplane, or Aichi E-3A, which was designed by Heinkel. These were introduced in 1930 following a competition against Nakajima's E-4N1. Although only 12 Aichi E-3A1s were built, they stuck around until 1937. The next meaningless little biplane was the Navy Type 90-2 reconnaissance seaplane, or Nakajima E-4N2, which was an improved version of the aircraft that had lost to Aichi in 1930. This aircraft had been heavily influenced by the American Vought O2U Corsair. N no, not, not that Corsair. There we go. 147 were produced until 1934 by Nakajima and Kawanishi, and saw service in China. The Navy Type 90-3 reconnaissance seaplane, or Yokosuka E-5Y, was essentially an improved Yokosuka E-1Y. Although only 20 were built, the type was licensed produced by Kawanishi as the E-5K-1, who built a further 20. These saw service in China during the si Shanghai Incident in 1932. The Yokosuka E6Y1 was a novel idea based off the British Parnell Pito, which was a reconnaissance floatplane deployed from a submarine. The first Japanese submarine-borne floatplane, the Yokosuka 1Go, had been tested successfully in 1927, being based on a German design from 1922, the Kaspar U1, conceived by Ernst Heinkel. This aircraft was built to be folded and packed up into a 7.4 meter long, 1.7 meter wide watertight cylinder mounted on a U-boat. Although the Germans did not pursue this project further after three Kaspar U-1s were built and evaluated, Japan was very interested in the concept. 
After the Yokosuka 1 Go proved the concept, Yokosuka set about improving the design coming up with the 2 Go and the 2 Go Kai in 1929 and 1931 respectively. In 1932, the Japanese Navy accepted the 2 Go and redesignated it as the Type 91 reconnaissance seaplane Yokosuka E6Y1. A total of eight were built by Kawanishi and by 1934. In 1932, the Imperial Japanese Navy requested the Kawanishi Aircraft Company to design a replacement for the Yokosuka E5Y and the Kawanishi E5K. By 1933, a prototype was ready and was selected over its competitor for the contract, the Aichi AB-6. Kawanishi's aircraft, designated the Navy Type 94 Reconnaissance Seaplane, or E-7K-1, entered service in 1935 where it proved to be a popular but unreliable aircraft. An improved version, the Navy Type 94 Reconnaissance Seaplane Model 2, or Kawanishi E-7K-2, was introduced in 1938 and featured a more reliable Mitsubishi Zuise 11 radial engine, as opposed to the E-7K-1's Hero Type 91 W-12 inline engine. The E-7K-2 was used on front-line warships in the Imperial Japanese Navy until 1943, while the E-7K-1 was held in reserve. Both versions were named ALF by the Allies during the Second World War, and they were both used for kamikaze operations towards the end of the conflict. In total, 183 E-7K-1s and 350 E-7K-2s were built by Kawanishi and Nippon Hikoki KK. Around the same time, the Imperial Japanese Navy approached Nakajima to commission a replacement for the Nakajima E-4N. Their prototype, the Nakajima MS, defeated its competitors from Aichi and Kawanishi and was ordered into production as the Navy Type 95 Reconnaissance Seaplane Model 1, or E-8N1, in 1935. These were issued to all of the Japanese Navy capital ships then in service, as well as 16 cruisers and 5 seaplane tenders. Here they served as spotter and reconnaissance aircraft as well as for light bombing duties during the Second Sino-Japanese War. Although in production until 1940, by the time Japan entered the Second World War, the E-8N1 and the more powerful E-8N2 had been mostly relegated to second-line duties. However, one flew reconnaissance for the battleship Haruna during the Battle of Midway, and another was purchased by the German naval attaché to Japan in 1941, whereupon it was stationed on board the auxiliary cruiser Orion. This was the only Japanese-made aircraft operated by Nazi Germany during the Second World War. Soon after Midway, the E-8N was retired from frontline service, being replaced by more modern aircraft. In total, 755 were built. The Allies called it Dave. Which brings us finally to the subject of today's video, the Mitsubishi F-1M. The Imperial Japanese Navy approached Kawanishi, Aichi and Mitsubishi in 1934 to design a replacement for the Nakajima E-8N as the main short-ranged reconnaissance floatplane to be issued to Japanese warships. While Kawanishi withdrew from the competition, the Aichi F-1A and the Mitsubishi K-17 were submitted for trial in 1936. While Mitsubishi's aircraft was superior, it had some issues regarding stability both in the air and on the water. Mitsubishi responded by straightening the K-17s, now designated F-1M-1's wings, increasing their dihedral, enlarging the fin and rudder, increasing the size of the floats, and replacing the Nakajima Hikari-1 engine with a Mitsubishi Zuisai, which, in addition to providing an additional 55 horsepowers, gave the pilot better forward visibility, as the Mitsubishi engine was narrower than the Nakajima. This improved aircraft was accepted into service with the Imperial Japanese Navy as the Navy Type Zero Observation Seaplane Model 11, or Mitsubishi F-1M2. The new aircraft was issued to eight battleships including the Nagato, the Yamato, and the Musashi, as well as nine cruisers, six seaplane tenders, and a number of shore-based units. 
While the capital ship's aircraft were used exclusively for gunnery observation and scouting, those based on the seaplane tenders and at shore installations were pressed into a number of roles for which the F-1M2 had not been designed, including convoy escort, maritime patrol, anti-submarine warfare, search and rescue, and light bombing. Some were even used as fighters, especially in the Aleutian Islands, the Solomons, and in New Guinea. On one occasion, a flight of four F-1M2s is reported to have destroyed an American motor torpedo boat, PT-34, on the 9th of April 1942. F-1M2s also provided air support for every Japanese amphibious landing, spotting for warship bombardment before acting as fighters and dive bombers for the ground forces landing ashore. Although I can find no record of the Mitsubishi F-1M, or Pete as the Allies called it, being used for kamikaze operations, it was used as a fighter for the defence of J the Japanese home islands in 1945, where it suffered heavily at the hands of the very advanced Allied fighters then in service. In total, 1,124 F-1Ms were built by Mitsubishi and the 21st Naval Air Arsenal, including four F-1M1 prototypes and several F-1M2-K training aircraft, which were conversions from the standard F-1M2. As well as being operated by the Imperial Japanese Navy Air Service, Mitsubishi F-1Ms were used by the Royal Thai Navy, the country of Thailand being a puppet state to Japan. In addition, the Indonesian Air Force acquired a lot of ex-Japanese aircraft in 1945 following Japan's surrender, including a number of Mitsubishi F-1M2s. These were used in their fight against the Dutch during Indonesia's War for Independence. Right then, enough of that blathering, and time for some different kind of blathering, because it's time to take a little look at the Mitsubishi F-1M2 in the wonderful world of War Thunder. Oh man, it's so beautiful. Right then, so here we have the Mitsubishi F-1M2 in the wonderful World of War Thunder. It is quite wonderful, isn't it? The Mitsubishi, not the world. Well, the world is quite wonderful. Anyway, so there it is there. It's on the water, because it's a float plane. Isn't it pretty? Anyway, I've got some scripted stuff to get through first, so let's uh, jump right in. In War Thunder, the Mitsubishi F-1M2 is a single-engine, single-bay biplane float plane that is usually used as a fighter and as a ground attack aircraft. It features a crew of two, the pilot and the gunner. There they are there, you can see them right there. That's the pilot, he sits where you'd imagine he'd sit. And there's the gunner, he sits in the back. He's got his own little cockpit. Oh, see, look, canopy. The pilot doesn't get that the latter of which would also act as observer in real life, so that's the gunner. The power plant consists of a single Mitsubishi Zuisei 13 14-cylinder double-row air-cooled radial piston engine producing 770 horsepower or 566 kilowatts. So, there it is there, in the front, apparently the propeller. The engine does feature wartime emergency power, boosting power output to 839 horsepower, or 617 kilowatts. However, the engine will begin to overheat after about three minutes. So, watch your boosting, otherwise you might overheat. Although I haven't actually managed to critically overheat the engine yet while applying WEP. At least not that I can remember. Uh, probably after a while it will start, though, in, you know, battle conditions and that. The F1M2 features no armour, and the armament consists of two fixed forward firing 7.7mm or .303 inch Type 97 machine guns in the nose, with 500 rounds of ammunition each. So here they are, uh, just behind the uh, oil cooler there. I'll get to that in a moment. It also has a single 7.7mm Type 92 machine gun on a flexible mount in the rear cockpit, with 582 rounds of ammunition fed by 97 round pan magazines. So yeah, there it is there. It says in War Thunder that the defensive machine gun is a Type 97, similar to the two fixed forward firing weapons, but this is incorrect. The Type 97 was a belt-fed licensed copy of the Vickers E machine gun, and specifically intended to be mounted as the fixed armament for aircraft, whereas the Type 92 was a licensed copy of the Lewis machine gun, featuring a pan magazine. The weapon we see here... Nah, 
is clearly not a Type 97. It is a Type 92, the weapon which was most commonly used defensive armament for Japanese aircraft. Anyway, additionally, the F1M2 can carry two 60kg Navy Type 97 No. 6 ground bombs in underwing bomb racks, making, the aircraft, uh, making this aeroplane somewhat useful in attacking ground targets. So, modifications. You can carry two 60kg bombs. There they are there. 60 kilograms. That's 10 kilograms more than what you get with most aircraft. Cruising speed is around 270, uh, 207 miles per hour at 2,000 feet, or 333 kilometers per hour at 610 meters. So I did actual testing for that for that number. This this is a little bit generous, I think. Maximum safe speed is 320 miles per hour, or 514 kilometers per hour. Uh, at, this w uh, at that point, uh, the he'll start saying, "Hey, you're going a little bit too fast, mate. Better, better think about slowing down." Your outrigger floats, though, they'll fall off at 300 miles per hour. So I think that is the real safe overspeed sort of speed, because you kind of need them to land with. That's around uh, 483 kilometers per hour. The aircraft itself will begin to break apart at 350 miles per hour, or uh, 563 kilometers per hour. So, well, I guess that's what it's referring to. This I couldn't be bothered to test. 30,000 feet. It'll take hours to get up that high, but uh, I'm sure it can get it up there if you try it. Turn time, 17 seconds. Uh, it turns a lot quicker than that, i found. It's a very, very manoeuvrable aeroplane. That's its primary uh, advantage over other aircraft in this game. It's manoeuvrability. Speed, nothing really to write home about. But the manoeuvrability, four, you can outturn a chica in this thing. Uh, if you uh, know what you're doing, at least. You get flaps with this aeroplane, so that's very good. You get combat flaps or landing flaps. You don't get takeoff flaps, but you don't really need them. It's a biplane. And uh, so, yeah. No armor, as I said. X ray. You get a tiny little oil cooler right here underneath, which is just in the right place to be hit by flak coming up from underneath. So that's rather irritating. Got three fuel tanks. Uh, in the fuselage, so that's nice. None out here in the wings, where they're liable to get chopped up. Three different fuel tanks, so if one of them gets hit and it leaks all the fuel out, no self-sealing, of course. Oh, it says self-sealing. That's actually incorrect. I think. Huh. Nothing I read said anything about self-sealing fuel tanks, but there you go. One underneath the pilot, so if that catches fire... Um, He's going to know to bail out quick, or he's, he's going to get a heated seat. And the oil cooler, the main oil reservoir, is up here, in between the two machine guns. And at the front you've got the, uh, the Zuisai engine. That's incorrectly spelled. There's no Y in Zuisai. It should be spelled Z-U-I-S-E-I, -E not Y. Indigo. No. India, as opposed to Yankee. Yeah. Right, let's fly it around a little bit. Won't that be fun? Actually, before we do that, first of all, let's uh, check out the ammunition choices you get. Well, it's nothing really surprising. You get default rounds with tracer bullets, adjustment incendiary bullets. I wonder what they are, actually. One sec, I'm going to check this out. Okay, so I've just looked it up. Adjustment incendiary bullets, apparently, they... It, they give off a flash upon impacting the target, so you know you've hit it. Um, I'd rather know I've hit it by you know, fire and smoke and bits coming out of the aeroplane, but there you go. you got ball on the purpose bullets, that's just a solid bullet. Armor-piercing bullets, they, uh, they've they got a uh, you know, something like a ferrite core, a tungsten core, something like that, which means it can go through armour. You don't really need to use this. The only aeroplanes that have armour at this sort of tier are the Russians. And, you know, they're better to set on fire. 
And you also get incendiary bullets. Everyone likes incendiary bullets. They make lots of flames. Universal. This is the one I usually almost exclusively use. You get some tracer bullets. You get armor-piercing bullets. And you get adjustment incendiary bullets. Hmm. That's interesting. No proper incendiaries. Oh, you might want to use the default then. Unless, of course, you use the stealth rounds, which are usually the best ones. Tracers, you get tracer bullets and one armor piercing bullet per three tracer bullets. So, pretty much useless, don't use that. Stealth rounds, you get no tracers, so you don't really know where your bullets are going, but if you're a very, very uh, good pilot, like uh, a certain someone you might know, not me, it's Squire. Anyway, so you might want to use these. Uh, incendiary bullets, armor piercing bullets, and adjustment incendiary bullets. All very useful. The adjustment incendiary bullets, I'm not sure if they can set things on fire. They might sell set fabric stuff on fire, but you won't set metal on fire with these. The incendiary bullets, they at least go through the body of the aircraft and hopefully set fire to something like inside. So, which is a little bit more useful. So, I would recommend using the stealth rounds if you can use them. If not, uh, default maybe for the incendiary bullets or universal because universal is usually a good bet I just need to purchase some more for the turret you get three ammunition choices as with most aeroplanes whoopsie daisy let me just purchase some more bullets so you get default for which is pretty much the exact same as the default for the primary uh, weapons you know choices A, I, B, A, P, I all that sort of stuff. Armor targets. Uh, this is these are actually quite useful. I've found because um, when aeroplanes are attacking you, pretty much you, ha you ha when you're shooting back at them, you have to shoot through the engine. And for that, armor-piercing bullets might actually be quite useful. So you get tracer bullets; they're useless. And armor-piercing bullets, they'll uh, they'll damage the engine, hopefully. And for the APT ra uh, belts, you get just more tracer bullets and less armor piercing bullets. So while this is a 3 slash 1 ratio, this is a 2 slash 2 ratio. So actually I'd recommend going with the armored targets belt because you get fewer tracers but you don't really need them and you get more armor piercing bullets which will do more damage to the target. So use the universal or the stealth and the armored targets. So there you go, ammunition choices. Isn't that wonderful? Right then, so here we are out here on the open ocean in our lovely Mitsubishi F1M2. Over there is uh, the island of Pilelu. I thought it was Pilelu, but that's what it is over there. <coughs> Pardon me. Anyway, so this is what the cockpit looks like. Mind you, don't get seasick. Uh, I won't talk about the instruments while we're on the ground because A, I will get seasick, and B, there is no sources on the internet explaining what the hell these instruments mean, and they're all in Japanese. So we'll have to figure out what they mean once we're up in the air and they're actually doing something. So, without further ado, let's get the engine started. Oh, uh, back there there's... Uh, Takahashi. Or whatever his name is. Operating the uh, anti-aircraft machine gun. So, I'm going to start the en uh, engine. It's a lovely sounding engine with these Japanese aeroplanes. I do like the sound of the engine. And uh, we'll set, uh, we don't actually need to set the flaps, but uh, we'll just show them to you. So, there we go, landing flaps. They'll be useful for when you're landing, because you've got no brakes on the water. These are the only brakes you have, the landing flaps. You also get combat flaps. These are very useful when you're fighting Russian biplanes, so you can outturn them. This is a very maneuverable aeroplane. It's not quite manoeuvrable enough on its own to outmaneuver Russian aircraft. You get ailerons on both the upper wings and the lower wings. Well, that's nice. Rudder at the back, where you'd expect it to be. Elevators, they, you can't flip them up and down on the water for some reason. You can on the land, but not on the water. So, let's go taking off. Here we go. up to speed, water splishing in my face, and there we are, we're up in the air. Ah, uh, how lovely. 
It is a very pretty aeroplane, isn't it? If you like that sort of thing, that is. Anyway, so yeah, the cockpit this is what it looks like. Got a pretty good view actually for a biplane. The, uh, the upper wing is just at that sort of level where it's not especially in the way. Unlike with the swordfish where it blocks a large proportion of your view plus all the struts blocking the view. This one has it nicely uh, positioned so it uh, takes up as little room of little of your field of view as possible. The struts, they get on the way a little bit, but they are rather minimal, so you can see relatively well. This is a single bay biplane, unlike the swordfish, which is a two bay biplane. The bay is referring to that strut over there, and if it was a two bay biplane, there would be another strut connecting the top wing to the bottom wing there, and there would be another bay. Rearwards view is excellent. Downwards view is also excellent. The pilot sits very high up. So, you know, while this might make him a little bit more vulnerable from attacks from behind, he can uh, at least look around. Better than the observer, actually, which is odd. The pilot can look all the way down, almost. Yeah. Look, there's, there's boats down there, he would say. So you got the uh, the gun sight, you got an analog gun sight, and you got another analog gun sight. Well, you got the uh, ring and bead gun sight up ahead, and you got a telescope with which to look through. If you if you like looking through telescopes, I don't really like the telescope view. It, uh, it reduces your field of view, and you can't really tell how far away you are from the target. Anyway, controls-wise, you got the. Uh, control column that controls your ailerons and your elevators, you've got your rudder controls down there, you've got your throttle, there's your wartime emergency power, you reduce it all the way down and you put it all the way back up. Alright, now let's try and figure out what these controls mean. Like I said, there was no source on the internet explaining how these work and no sources in any of the various books that I tried to read on the subject. Ugh. Right, let's start with the obvious. Two big machine guns. Those are the Type 97 machine guns. You can manually recharge them here in the cockpit, so if they jam, you just pull that big wooden lever, and that should recharge the guns. You can't do that in War Thunder for some weird reason. Like there, he's got the Type 92 to play with. Okay. Now there is the side slip indicator, so if we apply the rudder... Whoa, lots of side slip! Oh dear! And underneath it is the uh, little bubble thing that tells you... Oops, a daisy. Wrong button. How much you're leaning to the side. I don't know what that is. What these are... Okay. One on the left is the airspeed indicator. One on the right, altitude. Okay? I think. In meters. Because Japanese use metric. And underneath there is the direction indicator. So if we turn over in this sort of direction. Um, direction indicator will turn. Is that 12 right now? turn again. It's at three, so yeah, that is the direction indicator, or compass, if you will. Um, what have we got down here? I think that is fuel flow. Fuel pressure. Maybe it's an old speedometer. That yeah, must be fuel pressure. And next to it, oil pressure, maybe? Okay, over there, that thing is the tachometer. And next to it is the chronometer, or clock, as other people call it. So yeah, the one with the red thing is the tachometer. That down there, I think, 
could be fuel gauge, maybe. That over there. No idea what that could be. Um, some more dials. <laughs> oh, dear, dear me. Okay, here we go. Something we can suss. That handle, that little cranky handle thing, that's got to be... No, it can't be. Can't. Might be fuel selector. Okay, I've got no idea what happens. Down there, you got the uh, fuel primer, so you squirt some fuel into the engine using that. Down there, oxygen supply, probably. And something else. Okay, well, on the other side of the machine gun. Okay, that's got to be fuel selector dial. Oh, why is this so incomprehensible? Because it's in Japanese and you can't read Japanese. Why can't I read Japanese? Because it's a difficult language to learn. Okay. Wait, wait. That dial there, the one, the funny shaped one, that's got to be the fuel level. And underneath it, um, no, not so much to do with altitude. Not so much to do. Oh, okay, I don't know what that is. Oy, oy, oy. Hey, people on the internet, if you know what these instruments do, do a diagram and put it on Google Images or something. I mean, this is ridiculous. No idea what any of these instruments do. Oh, that lever there, that controls the flaps. So you see that lever is moving? That's the flap control lever. We should be able to find out what controls the cowling. The radiator cowling, the engine cowling flaps. Just overheat the engine a little bit. Yeah, let's see if that works. There we go. See anything closed in the cooling flaps? No, can't see anything moving. Right, well, I don't know what operates that. Now, with most Japanese aircraft, the trigger is situated on the throttle. For some bizarre reason. I think the Japanese just want it to be different. You can't see it here, being controlled. But they are there. Front. You see, shooting through the uh, old uh, ring and bead gun sight. Here they go through the uh, telescope. Let's go shoot at that truck over there. That's what we're going to do. While we're on the way there, we can see what the turret looks like. There it is there. Very limited field of fire with the turret. That's as far as it goes left. That's as far as it goes right. Down, that's as far as it goes up. Barely past the fin. You can't shoot through the fin, of course. Why would you want to do that? And there you go. It's fine. So yeah, this thing is... Oh, features just the old putt-putt machine guns. Similar to the ones that you get with the British early aircraft. You know, the Furies and such. So, not particularly good. Usually run out of ammo by the time you shot anything down. So, let's shoot at this ground vehicle I'm missing because I'm a terrible shot. And there we go, flying through the flames very dramatically. Now, let's test the bombs. There's a whole row of Japanese half tracks or trucks or whatever down there. We'll just pretend that they're pesky British trucks and drop our ground bombs out. Oops, they're ambulances. Okay. That was very naughty. Not really supposed to be bombing ambulances, but... 
Now you can see the effect of the 60 kilogram bombs. These are actually pretty effective bombs for their size. Because they're slightly bigger than the 50 kilogram bombs you get with the Germans and the Russians, they're actually uh, pretty useful. You can actually use them against ground targets in uh, you know, ground battles. So yeah, I'd recommend using this aeroplane for Japanese ground battles instead of the Kai-10s, because this is mm, more useful to get more bombs. It's also very useful as a fighter. It's not very fast, but it's very manoeuvrable. So you should be able to take out any any opposition if you know what you're doing. Now it's coming for a landing, so you can just see how this thing does a landing. Out at sea, you might flip it if the seas are rough. So be wary of that. On an inland cove like this, well, this is more of a out coastal cove. We're not inland, we're on an island. But yeah, a cove like this, the water is very calm, nice and flat. If possible, find a nice flat area of calm to land on. Although, of course, you've got to go out to sea and park next to your carriers if you want to rearm. There we are. Bring it to a nice, gentle, graceful, and a little bit shimmying halt. There we are. Raise the flaps and turn off the engine. There we are. Now, because in War Thunder most of the battles you'll be fighting take place on land battles where there isn't much of in the way of water to land on, you'll have to land this thing on the ground. A lot of people say, "Hey, I'm in a float plane and this is ground. Is this? There's no sea." What, what do I do? Well, I guess I'll just fly around and do nothing till battle's over, because I can't possibly land. Well, actually, I'm here to tell you that you can land a float plane on the ground, and I will show you how to do it. Right. So, let's just get the engine started, and we'll take off and land on the runway that's just over those trees over there. It's actually not very difficult at all. You just land basically as if you've got wheels. And hopefully the aeroplane won't flip over. You've got to be a little bit more careful, of course, because you're scraping the hull of the aeroplane along the ground. But it's not really all that much different from, like I said, landing an aeroplane with wheels. Right, so we're going around 120, 130 miles per hour. That's round landing speed. Deploy the combat flaps. Deploy the landing flaps. Got to go very slowly and touch down very gently, but of course you should be doing that anyway. And here we go, as slow as possible. And there, scraping along the ground. Didn't even damage it. How simple was that? I'm sure the technicians will be very happy that you've managed to land without even scraping the paint. Of course, in uh, real battles, uh, by which I mean uh, realistic quote unquote battles, after you've landed, you'll be rearmed and repaired and then spawned somewhere above the uh, runway so you won't have to take off from it because <laughs> you can't. We're pretty much rooted to the ground here. So, yeah, I'll show you. Too much friction. That's why aeroplanes taking off from the ground tend to have wheels, or if they're on ice or snow, skis. Floats are for landing on water. But sometimes desperate measures take desperate circumstances. Except the other way round. Right, I think it's high time I stopped blathering uh, about this sort of rubbish and started blathering about how I got on flying this aeroplane in battle. So won't you uh, just you know, s sit back and uh, I'll uh, switch over to battle mode. Here we go. Well, I could barely hear any of that. Could you? Right, so here we are in the first attempt at battle. I get caught up in a uh, tangle, of, tangle of fighters in somewhere in Russia, because we all know the Japanese fought in Russia. I'm initially going after ground targets here so I take a few shots on that thing but 
you know, there's too many fighters around. Can't really, uh, can't really do anything until all these fighters have gone away. Uh, flax starts opening up, and pretty soon I crash into him, or he crashes into me. It's a head-on collision, so it's neither of our fault. Anyway, so next battle, Pearl Harbor. Here we go. Going to attack this gun, no pillbox. Drop my bombs. As you can see, they were perfectly on target, but they didn't do anything. So there you go. Anyway, so now we're going to buzz around a bit, see if there's any softer targets we can shoot at with our machine gun. Initially think about heading back, getting more bombs, because the flank seems a little bit hairy. Then I decide, no, that's being very cowardly. I'm going to go attack head on. By the way, I apologise for the uh, nasally sort of quality of my voice right now. I do have a little bit of a cold. Yes, these videos take a while. Well, several days, in fact, to make. And during the course of making this video, I developed a cold. Anyway, you might have just caught that there. I shot down an aeroplane. Shot it a couple of times and he ploughed into the sea. I didn't really hit him that hard. I guess he just made a mistake. Anyway, so now I think again about heading back to get more bombs. Fleck is shooting at me again. I have taken a little bit of wing damage, but you know, it's not really that much. But then I decide, no, I'm going to go and attack this AA position. Or triple A position, whatever. It is. Anti aircraft artillery. So triple A. I do it in first person mode for maximum dramatic effect. And there you can see the telescope. It's quite useful occasionally, especially if you're shooting ground targets, but then. Yeah, you've got to be careful to avoid the trees. There's a truck going by. I shoot at it a couple of times, also with my machine gun. Uh, nothing happens. And then, shoot at another thing. It blows up. But it's not dead yet. I shoot it with my turret, uh, uh, not turret, my rear mounted machine gun. But then the flak starts getting accurate. I start taking a lot of damage. Leaking oil, and then my wing gets sawed off by a cargo ship. How humiliating. Next, we're here in, G in uh, Kalkin Gol, which is a proper place where the Japanese actually fought. Get him, get, there's another tangle of fighters. There's a hurricane. I guess the Russians did use hurricanes, didn't they, on occasion. He tries to turn fight with me, which is very foolish. I've dumped my bombs, because at this point maneuverability is more important. But then he gets smart and starts flying away. There's no way I can catch him. I'm a biplane with a bunch of floats stuck onto it. And there's another there's a bunch more fighters coming in. There's a... I uh, can't really tell what that is. I'm looking at a tiny screen. It's a fighter. It's a uh, pea shooter. He tries to turn the fighting as well. I go up and over and do the ropey dope or whatever. And I manage to uh, almost get behind him, but then the hurricane comes back and he tears me apart. Shot my float off. I'm leaking coolant everywhere. My engine's died. And I'm thinking, oh no, how am I ever going to land this? But the P 36 comes along. Oh, oh dear. Oh, that was very dramatic. Another plane just flew into me. It was one of those funny French things with the air-cooled inline engine. Anyway, next battle, here we go. I uh, didn't actually die in this one, but I didn't do anything, really. This goddamn HE-100 kept stealing my kills, dude! Nah, I suppose it's fair enough. I'm too slow to get anywhere, so... Faster aeroplanes get to shoot down the things. As you can see, I don't have any bomb racks on this aeroplane at the moment. I decided to uh, forego the ground attacking and instead try and be a fighter. I'm 
So I'm uh, chasing down an I-15 and my, one of my floats comes off. You can see at what sort of speed the floats come off. It's around uh, 300 miles per hour. Or however many kilometers per hour that is in the uh, technical dis description I did earlier. Uh, so yeah, it's continuing a little bit on, still with no float. There's P36 or P26, can't really tell at this distance. P36 it looks like. The lag 3, I'm diving on them. Looks like I'm going to get some shots off here. Doesn't it? And, oh, I start shooting. I miss because I'm a terrible shot. Still missing. Still, oh, I hit it, but then a P36 comes and ruins my fun. Right, next battle here we're on Sicily. We all know about the Japanese intervention in the Isles of Sicily. And um, diving down on some aeroplanes buzzing about. There's a lag three over there. And I'm thinking, oh, lag three. They usually flown by not very experienced people who are taken in by the shiny, shiny 20 millimeter schwack. And so they try to turn fight it. And I am a pesky little Japanese biplane. As you see, I am immune to turn fighting. Well, we'll put that to the test later. So I start opening fire. And then I crit him. And you think, whoa, this is this is pretty much a done deal. He's going to shoot him down. I have a shoot him. I don't know why he's going so slow. He must have been attacking ground targets. But this takes a lot longer than you would expect. Partially due to the fact that I am an atrocious shot which in part is due to my own skill level which is a little less than what you might expect and partially due to the maneuverability of this airplane making it a rather unstable gun platform so you know it's quite difficult to actually uh, keep your targeting reticle in a uh, specific place for any length of time Still chasing now. No, why, no, no idea why he doesn't just, you know, zoom off into the sunset. No, I could catch him if he opens up his throttle. Maybe he must have engine damage or something. I mean, he does have engine damage, but that was what I caused later. The engine won't have, you know, overheated by now. Still shooting at him. I guess it's also in part due to the absolute, you know, in in. What inadequacy there we go. Inadequacy of these Japanese machine guns. Too low rate of fire, not enough incendiaries. I'm using uh, universal rounds, which I think don't actually contain any incendiaries apart from immediate action incendiaries, which are pretty much just fancy tracers. I'm running low on ammunition now, and the oil gets all, all up in my face here. So I uh, turn away and come back. He's finally going in a straight line. Uh, but then he gets close enough to his uh, airbase for the anti-aircraft defences to start opening up. And we all know what happens to aeroplanes who fly around the enemy airbase, don't we? Mm -hmm. Especially in a very slow, very fragile Japanese biplane. Take a few angry little shots with my machine gun. I'm a little bit salty right now because... Uh, you know, spent all that time chasing him down to Watervale. So I shoot at this uh, here half track. They open up with their 50 cows. Luckily, they're not very good shots. You can see that the anti aircraft defences from the airbase actually started an oil leak as well as a fuel leak. No self sealing tanks in this aeroplane, despite what the technical views would have you believe. It's a Japanese aeroplane. They don't have self-sealing tanks until 43, I think. Anyway, so I'm flying back to the airbase now. And here you can see a very perfectly executed landing with a float plane on the ground. So there's no excuses for you who say you can't do it. It's, it's easy. It's just like landing a regular aeroplane. Just a little bit slower with higher stakes. And there we are, see? 
How easy was that? It was pretty easy, I'll tell you. Do it all the time because I'm a, I'm a super smart boy. Anyway, turn the engine off, and a little while later we're back up in the air. There's a lot of gunfire down there, like a proper war zone. And the last aeroplane on the enemy team is a Catalina. It's the British version of the PBY, or rather the British used one. The Americans uh, send them a lot in lend -lease. They also send a bunch to Russia, incidentally. But this isn't the Catalina video. This is the F1M video, so I'm attacking them. I'm shooting with my tiny little machine guns. They're not going to do anything, are they? Although I do hit one of the gunners. Uh, but the whatever that airplane is manages to the Flegels BF-109 gets the kill. I suppose that's fair enough. He was shooting at it first. I just helped. He's still shooting at me with his 50 caliber machine guns. But there's a little bit of time left, so I'm going to go attack a ground target. There's a uh, another half track down there. I think I'll shoot at it. So yes, hopefully this video has illustrated the uh, shortcomings of the F1M as a fighter. Oh, we've got the final blow awardment, uh, uh, achievement, awardment. Anyway, next battle we're back on Sicily, except it's daytime, and we're up in a tangle of aeroplanes. And I do a loop. De loop, which is a little bit foolish. This aeroplane doesn't really have the uh, energy potential to be able to do those sorts of maneuvers. Better to just do horizontal turns, because you can pretty much outturn any other aeroplane in the horizontal, as long as you don't run out of energy. In the vertical, however, you run out of energy very quickly, and I fly into a tree, and I'm being uh, picked apart by a gladiator, which has far more energy potential. Anyway, next battle, we're on Mozdok. Well, they the Japanese fought in Mozdok, don't we? And so I'm going to drop my bombs on this here light pillbox. You think light pillbox? Well, they're easy to kill. Well, you'd be surprised. They look pretty much on target, don't they? Well, it turns out they weren't. According to War Thunder. So I'm thinking about turning around, shooting at the uh, gun emplacements, and in fact I do do that shooting at it with my machine guns. He catches fire but he's not dead yet because the, uh, you know, the gunnery crews are like, oh, a little bit of fire? That doesn't impress us, we're Russians. And so I turn back and shoot at it with my machine guns. A little quick burst wasn't that professional. And then I decide, hey, let's go t save that BF-109. And I arrive too late to save the BF-109. And then they all turn on me and say, Ooh, look, a little Japanese biplane. Let's murder him slowly. And they do. Isn't this just like a nature documentary? So, next battle, we're on... Uh, well, I can't really tell where this is. Somewhere in Russia. No, this is Calcum Girl again. And there's an I-16, I Model 5. I think I can turn with him, but turns out the I-16 can turn me. I uh, must have made a mistake there or something. But I actually survived the landing, believe it or not. The dog just clattered onto the floor, ruining my video. And here we go. I think this is the final attempt. This is the one that sticks. And so this is the spawn you get. You spawn above the uh, the airfield. And I've decided to go fighter mode again. I wouldn't really recommend using this aeroplane as a dedicated fighter. That's not really what it's for. It wasn't designed to do that. I mean, the Japanese did use it to be a dedicated fighter. But they weren't very successful at it, as far as I can tell. What I'd recommend using this aeroplane for is as a ground attack aeroplane first and use its maneuverability and offensive capabilities to defend yourself if you're uh, swooped on by a pesky American aeroplane. So, we're climbing up into the stratosphere. 
very, very slowly. Not quite as slow as some aeroplanes that have been featured on this channel thus far, but still, it's pretty slow. It is, after all, a biplane with three giant unaerodynamic un floats glued to the underside. So, still climbing. Climbing up and up and away. And so we're, uh, yeah, there's a bunch of bombers. Bombers are flying about, they're going to drop some bombs. That's what bombers tend to do, really. And BR-20, I think that's a type of Fiat. You're diving down for some reason. You don't want to dive down. That's where all the fighters are. I hope he's just decided to commit suicide. Unless he's flying towards me. I can't really tell with this sort of tiny screen. I'm looking at a tiny little editing screen. And so I can't really tell how far away things are. I suppose I can make the screen a little bit bigger. Here we go. Oh, it's still very low quality. Anyway, so there's a whole knot of enemy fighters down there. I'm not going to go swooping into them. Because that will really lead to similar sorts of results as we saw earlier. It's best to pick off individual targets. I guess the way you should use this aeroplane is, is more of a vulture-ish. You know, you, you single out uh, crippled or damaged or... You know, lone aeroplanes that are low on ammunition that have already been attacked by more capable aeroplanes and then finish them off. That's what vultures do, isn't it? Except not aeroplanes. Uh, so I initially think about diving into that tangle, but no, I'm not going to do that. That would be suicide. There's an I-15 over there. I think that other aeroplane over there has got that gladiator under control. So I'm going after this I-15, who appears to be threatening that Kai-27. I don't know why he would be threatening the Kai-27. The Kai-27 is a far more capable aeroplane than the I-15. As overpowered as the I-15 is. God damn it, dog, you got to stop clattering into my room. Come here. Yes. How exciting you can hear me interacting with the dog in the course of a video about a Japanese float plane. You don't get this sort of uh, content with Fly Daily, do you? No. Nah. Although you might do, I don't really watch it. And so I decide that that Kai-27 does, in fact, have the I-15 under control, and I dive down on that funny French aeroplane. I-15 is diving down for some reason. And I'm looking around, and I'm thinking, Oh! That Kai... whatever needs help, but then the I... Uh, uh, yeah. Then the I-15 turns around, and I turn around, and I'm going after the French thing. The CR-714. Which is a funny little aeroplane. It's got an air-cooled inline engine. Made by Renault, don't you know? Quite an interesting thing. But this isn't the video about the CR714 either. This is about the F1M. It's got the traditional air-cooled radial engine. So I take a couple of shots at him, hit him a couple of times, he does evasive maneuvers, but then when I we're getting a little bit close to the air, air base, and so I turn away. You got lucky this time, French aeroplane. I'll get you next time. And so, there's the I-15 coming back, and he's going to attack our friend in the Kai-27. But I say, no, you leave that aeroplane alone. I shoot at him, and he starts turning. But... As I mentioned before, this airplane should really be more maneuverable. And I loop round, and I'm on his tail. I open fire, and he starts spewing some sort of fluid. 
that's that's very rude of you. Don't think that sort of thing nonsense. And I get close enough, and I manage to shoot him down. Just a moment. There we go. It's not much of an achievement, I know. It's a reserve biplane from Russia, but still. It took what five battles to get this far? I know I shot something down in the second video, or first video, or whenever it was, but that didn't really seem, seem like an achievement. There you can see how happy I am with the wing wiggle, wiggling my wings. I'm sure that Russian biplane player appreciated that. Anyway, so now with a uh, new sense of, of duty and purpose and whatever, I decided to go hunting for more pesky little biplanes to shoot down. And ho ho, what's this? A Dewatin D3735. Five. Whoa. Well, I'm, I'm going to shoot at him. Unless that Kai 27 knocks him. I try to make a point of not attacking airplanes that other players are attacking if I can help it. Or unless, you know, they seem like they need help. The ally player, that is. And once, he, once someone sets an airplane on fire, that's their kill. You don't shoot at it. Anyway, so he shoots it a couple of times and then seems to buzz off going after that other aeroplane. He must have taken a bit of damage because uh, later yeah, it comes into effect. But I of course managed to outmaneuver this silly French aeroplane and I get on his tail relatively quickly. Uh, I don't want to overshoot so I do a little loop-de-loop -loop or a barrel roll or whatever. Uh, I'm back on his tail again. And you would think, oh, he's got him. But no, I'm a terrible shot. But luckily, he flies into a tree. So the Kai-27 is going after that I-15, and I think, well, I'd better go along as backup then. If he doesn't manage it, I'll have to take over. This is the last enemy aeroplane, I think. Because I think that French aeroplane that we uh, attacked a little while ago donked his landing, and so he crashed. But oh no, the Kai-27 appears to be going very slowly, slowly and very lowly. Well, it turns out his engine was damaged in that encounter with the uh, French monoplane thing, and so he's trying to land. And I think, well, we better, we better protect that I-15. But no, he, he cold-bloodedly murders him on the ground. Now he's coming after me, so I'll have to do some evasive maneuvers. Well, unfortunately, that is a very maneuverable aeroplane, as I'm sure we all know. And although I may be more maneuverable, I do lose energy a lot faster, because I produce a lot more drag. And so I start uh, being outmaneuvered. And then, oh, in an attempt to avoid him, I fly into a tree. That was very silly of me, wasn't it? Ugh. But I decided that's good enough. And so there you have it. The uh, Mitsubishi F1M1. It is a... It's, uh, it's okay. It's a very pretty aeroplane. But unfortunately it doesn't seem to be that qu quite that capable. As I said before, you uh, probably want to use this thing as a ground attack aircraft primarily and only use its uh, capabilities as a fighter as a backup in case you're attacked while you're ground attacking. It is very maneuverable, but it loses energy very quickly and so it pretty much falls out of the sky. God damn it, dog! Stop clattering around! And, uh, hmm. So, don't go after the big knots of enemy fighters. Don't go looking for trouble. Remember, you're a vulture. You're not an eagle. You've got to, got to attack though the, the slow and the weak and the sick. Like that cowardly bastard you are. Anyway, so uh, yeah, hopefully you enjoyed this video. 
And, uh, well, hopefully you'll join us for the next one, where we'll be taking a little look at the uh, first of the Japanese tanks, the uh, Ha-Go, I think it's called, the funny little light tank that looks a little bit derpy. So yes, hopefully you'll join us for that one, and thank you very much for watching. Goodbye. Thank mm -hmm. you.